It's Thursday. Louis T Network podcast. I'm your man, Louis T. OJ Simpson died today. 76 years old. We'll talk a little bit about that. I don't think a lot of people like to give OJ his credit for what he has done for pop culture, but we'll elaborate. Josh Allen, the other Josh Allen, got to the bag. Big, big bag. We'll talk about that. Are teams going to be allowed to wear three helmets this season? We'll talk about that as well. And more here on the latest installment of the Louis T Network podcast that starts now. The Louis T Network is powered by Music Head University. Music Heads, classes in session. Turn me up. Enroll on YouTube now. Link is in the description. Who else could it be? Me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the 410th installment of the Louis T Network podcast. I, of course, am your set man, Louis T. Thank you for joining me on today's show. A number of topics to get to. One big one couple of small ones, and then anything in between that you guys want to chop it up about, you know how we do it. So we'll get to all of those things today on the show. First of all, I want to thank you guys for joining me uh, on this Thursday. And um, I want to talk about OJ Simpson to start the show off. OJ Simpson passed away uh, reportedly today uh, at the age of 76 from prostate cancer. Now, uh, his family had been denying rumors that he was in hospice as he battled uh, the prostate cancer. Uh, but obviously, those rumors were true as he succumbed to the um, effects of the prostate cancer and uh, reportedly peacefully, I don't know if there's a such thing unless you pass in your sleep, but uh, died surrounded by friends and family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a stain and a stigma attached to the name Orenthal James Simpson. We all know why. <clears throat> um, was charged with the murder of his ex-wife, um, Anna Nicole Smith. Um, but at the end of the day, um, or Anna Nicole Simpson, I guess. Um, I think I got the right person. Um, so long ago. Pretty sure that's her name. Uh, and Ron Goldman. And it was the trial of the century, 94. I remember it, the whole Bronco situation like it was yesterday. I do remember that. Um, and it captivated people, not just during that trial, but it and, and this is this probably is a history lesson for a lot of you youngsters out there that didn't know much about the OJ Simpson trial and, and his whole situation. First of all, let's go back in the timeline for a second to understand that OJ Simpson was a legend, okay? Highly decorated, very celebrated, embraced by mainstream culture. And he was in commercials. This The commercials, I think a lot of people of a certain age remember him from the Hertz commercials and things of that nature where he's jumping over um, things in the commercial. That's a little bit um, older than me. You know, that, that, that predates me by a bit. <clears throat> I've seen those commercials before, but those weren't playing when I was watching TV. What I do remember him from as an actor was... Um, the Naked Gun movies. And he was in a bunch of those, and he was very funny in those movies, along with Leslie Nielsen. And, you know, there were a million of those Naked Gun movies, and he was in a bunch of them. And a lot of people forget, too, that O.J. was a, um, a, a broadcaster. I think he might have been a sideline reporter for NBC Sports covering the NFL. A lot of people... Um, 
forget that portion of his career as well. And then not to mention OJ's historic Hall of Fame, NFL, and collegiate career. He was the first running back to run for 2,000 yards in an NFL season. And remember when OJ Simpson did it, or as he was called then, the juice. <laughs> when he did it, there were only 14 games in an NFL season, which makes it a little bit different. It hits different when you rush for 2K in a 14-game season. Now, I will say this, back in those days, running backs were getting a rock 30, 40 times a game, and it was different. The running back was the star of the show, unlike now where the quarterback is the, the prized possession. Back in those days, you were more likely to see a running back go number one overall in the draft than you were a quarterback. Anyway, he had a decorated career at USC, came into the NFL, went to the Buffalo Bills, tore it up with them, uh, you know, set all kinds of NFL records, obviously the most yards rushing in a single season, 2000, the first to ever do it. Um, and, and when his career was done, he went seamlessly and transitioned seamlessly into entertainment, whether you're talking about uh, being behind the mic, working for NC NBC Sports, or you're talking about doing movies and things of that nature, commercials. Uh, he was beloved by all. And then it all came crashing down in 1994. And <laughs> he maintains his innocence, but we all know what happened there. But Johnny Cochran, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. That was a hell of a team that OJ put together that was able to get him off of clear murder. Okay. That said, Nicole Brown, thank you. Nicole Brown. I called him Anna Nicole Smith. <laughs> I got my uh Nicole's mixed up. Uh Nicole, I guess she would be she would have been Simpson at that time. Um and Ron Goldman. I do remember his name. And you know, the trial was crazy. It captivated everyone. And he was found not guilty, which was to the surprise of many. Um, and ultimately, he would do some stupid shit down the road and end up going to prison anyway, which was sort of like a uh, a do-over, a makeup uh, call, if you will, for, you know, missing out on the, um, the, the murder, uh, the murders. Anyway. Um, that trial and how everything went ended up captivating people for many decades to come. I mean, they were still doing series and documentaries based off of that trial. I remember there was one on FX with um, Cuban Gooding Jr. Not too long ago, maybe like five, six years ago, right? So when I tell you that this thing had it took on a life of its own and it just continued to live. But the thing that I, I really love about that whole situation, I hate that people lost their life. I hate that um, the person that did it didn't, um, didn't have to uh, pay for his crimes because we all know OJ did the shit. You know, that when when Dave Chappelle says, uh, we don't know who did it, and then winks, we, we all know who did it. But the thing that I love about that whole situation is what OJ essentially did for pop culture with that. Now, there was so many jokes. I mean, comedians ate off of OJ for probably a decade plus. Uh, there were classic lines and 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 rap songs. Eminem had a crap classic line when he talked about um, OJ, Anna Nicole, and Ron Goldman. Um, what song was it? Don't you want to grow up to be just like me? Uh, I think he said. Me and Marcus Allen went over to see Nicole when we heard a knock at the door. Must have been Ron Gold. Jumped behind the door, put the orgy on hold, killed them both and smeared blood in a white Bronco. We did it. Like so many songs had lines that came from OJ, right? So many comics used punchlines that came from OJ. There was so much 
there was so much material that spawned from OJ. I have to say personally, thank you. As a, as a consumer of this, I have to say thank you. Because my experience as a consumer was, was bettered, for lack of a better term, was enhanced. That's an even better term enhanced because of oj simpson and and that trial and all that came with it and um it gave us you know i'm not black i'm oj from jay jay z on the 444 album right the 444 album so again we could go on and on and on and on about this at the end of the day um oj simpson was a massive figure whether you liked him you didn't like him he was a hell of a football player first turned massive entertainer and became a a notorious infamous pop culture figure and his legacy will live on whether you like it or you don't like it whether you're talking it was funny dave Chappelle said uh he talked about the four times that he met oj simpson i think it was four it might have been three times he had met him in his life i think it was four but he he tells them the lady she said how could you speak to that murderer <laughs> and he says with all due respect lady that murderer rushed for over 11,000 yards <laughs> shit is hilarious right so again so much funny so much i don't want to say good because two people lost their lives and the man who committed the murders didn't pay for it. But uh, so much came from that. So much material came from that. Whether it's, again, rap, comedy, you name it. Everybody touched on it. He was more than that, was O.J. Simpson. He was more than that. But at the end of the day, um, that'll probably be his legacy. Most people will remember him for that and none of the other stuff. And you know what? It is what it is. You make your bed, you have to lie in it. But O.J. Simpson, I will remember him for all of it. Not just that, all of it. He passes away at the age of 76 years old. Rest in peace to Juice. Um, Josh Allen, the other Josh Allen, not the quarterback that resides in Buffalo, but the edge rusher that resides in Jacksonville. That Josh Allen, he got to the bag yesterday. Massive deal. Five years, $150 million uh, for Josh Allen to sign on the dotted line. 88 of it fully guaranteed. So he now averages, um, I think he has the highest average um, in terms of, I think he has the third highest amount of guarantees behind Nick Boza and Miles Garrett. His deal is slightly higher than that of uh, Brian, uh, uh, Brian Burns, who just signed a similar deal with the Giants. It's not by much, but um, he, unlike Brian Burns, deserves that money based off of what he's done and what you project him to do moving forward. Brian Burns has not put in the same caliber of work nor the statistical production that a Josh Allen has. So I can co-sign this deal, feel good about what Jacksonville just did and feel good about what they're going to get moving forward. Whereas with the Giants, you're rolling the dice. And if that shit comes up, snake eyes, and you crap out, damn. We'll see what happens with the giant situation but good for josh allen he deserves this money 17 and a half sacks last year that's big boy production right there if i'm not mistaken he and tj watt led the league last year 17 and a half sacks so um you putting up that those kind of numbers you deserve to get broken off um and, and so big money for josh allen and uh, he remains in Jacksonville. I think now that leaves us with just two of the franchise taggies who don't have a long-term deal. Uh, if memory serves me correct, everybody else has signed a long-term deal. Jalen Johnson signed a long-term deal with the 
Bears. Um, Michael Pittman Jr. signed a long-term deal with the Colts. Josh Allen, as I just talked about, signed a long-term deal with the um, Jags. Brian Burns was traded to the Giants where he signed a long-term deal there. I think I'm missing. Uh, Justin Matabike signed a long-term deal. I think he was the first one to get a deal done with the Ravens. And I think there was one more player that ended up inking a long-term deal with his team. Uh, The two players that are left, I think it's Antoine Winfield Jr. of the Bucks and T. Higgins. And there's still a chance that he may be traded when it's all said and done. Um, My guess is he ends up back in Cincinnati, but I'm not even going front. We'll see what happens in the draft. If Cincinnati is able to land themselves a big-time receiver and they feel really good about it, it's deuces to T. Higgins. There will be a team out there that didn't get their hands on a big-time receiver after the draft is done and they feel like they need to go out and get a guy and Higgins will still be sitting there. So uh, we'll see. I don't know if the T. Higgins saga in Cincinnati is, is quite done yet. And I think I've read something yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, that where he said he has had no communication with Cincinnati whatsoever since the franchise tag was slapped on him, which makes sense because they have no intentions of signing him long-term. So um, it it makes a a, a ton of sense. And if they uh, are interested in getting something done, I think it'll be a trade, not bringing him back long-term because they have no intentions of signing him long-term and every intention of rearing up with Jamar Chase. So, um, my guess is they're going to draft themselves a receiver this year. They already moved on from Tyler Boyd. He's still a free agent, if I'm not mistaken. He'll probably sign here shortly. And then I think they're going to move T. Higgins if they can. And deadline spur action as we get closer to the draft. We'll see if something happens. If nothing happens, that means teams are waiting to see what uh, shakes free in the draft. And then if teams are disappointed with their haul post draft, you may see a team like a Buffalo, and I keep throwing them out there, or a Pittsburgh or a team like that, you might see one of those teams then get aggressive and go after a guy like T. Higgins. We will see. But I digress. Uh, Let's get to um, the gym dropping session today, shall we? I think we shall. Let me drop this gym on your meddling. Open your mind. Let your conscience be free. You're now rolling with your man, Louis T. Double E. Let me open you up. Get you thinking a little bit. So I'm going to start on this Rashid Rice situation because a lot of people have had takes on this. My take is going to be slightly different, but it's probably all the same when, when you when you listen to what I have to say. But this is not the first time I've had this conversation with you. I've had this conversation, and this is what frustrates me with this is I've had this conversation with you multiple times because this is not the first time that an athlete has done some stupid shit that was very avoidable um, and ultimately found themselves in hot water that was unnecessary. And they everything that they've worked for to this point, you are on the verge of throwing away foolishly because of what exactly? And we're going to get into that today. So for those of you who aren't privy to this information, um, Rashi Rice was racing with one of his ex SMU uh, teammates, one of his buddies from college, in a couple of rentals that were registered to Rashi Rice. He was in a truck. His buddy was in a um, some other a uh, foreign car. We're just gonna say both of them were in Lambos. One was a Lambo truck. The other was a car. I don't remember the exact car his friend was in. But they were racing, essentially. He rented those cars probably for the sole purpose of whipping the hell out of them and racing, which is just stupid when you think about it. But he's young, and young guys do stupid shit. But And there's no excuse for it either. But that's nor here nor there. Um, The thing that is so frustrating is there are enough examples of this shit going sideways 
in recent memory, like just the things that have happened as recent as like December, you know, or even I, I think it's pr probably the one with Georgia and, and, and one of the teammates losing his life in, in a race where Jalen Carter was involved. Uh, that probably was in early 2023, maybe even 2022. Uh, at, at any rate, we've seen this happen so often where guys race. And I, I can speak from personal experience. When I'm in traffic and I see two cars darting in and out of traffic like some dum-dums, I just get so upset because I'm like, one, where the hell are you going, bro? Like, literally, it's traffic. Where are you going? All right. Two, clearly, you don't give a damn about anybody's life, including your own. If you're out here racing on these, these public streets and interstates where so many people are in transit, just minding their business, abiding by the law, and you out here doing 90, 100, 110, where's the psychological? You want to go do that shit? Go to the Audubon, right? Go overseas and do that shit where it is common knowledge and it is actually... It is actually something that is urged. You go over there and you drive 110. Knock yourself out. They honk at you for doing 80 over there. All right? You ain't driving fast enough. They encourage that you drive fast over there. You want to drive fast? You want to race? Take your ass over there. Don't do that shit here. But <clears throat> I want to make my larger point. I've done this before, but... Rashid Rice is just another athlete in a long list of athletes who grew up, and I don't know his background, and I can't speak to how he grew up and what his situation was and none of that. But I can tell you, having been around athletes, seeing how they interact and how people interact with them, and having going to school with guys who have made it to the NFL, who their trajectory was heading in that direction when we were in high school and you kind of knew, hey, this guy has a shot. And how people responded to that individual and how he responded to people. You see this a lot. One of the biggest issues I have with athletes especially nowadays, is we're in a, a society and in a culture where we raise athletes to be pampered, to be catered to. And their egos are stroked from the time that they're in middle school. They're big men on campus in middle school, and we're putting them in these AAU and these seven-on-sevens and then all of these camps. And, you know, they're the number one. They're being recruited in middle school now. I mean, I won't be shocked if in the next few years we're talking about kids being recruited in elementary school. It's getting to that point. But they're recruiting kids in middle school. How do you think that makes a young kid feel when people are courting him at 11, 12, 13 years old, telling him how great he is? And he's going to be the next this and he's going to be the next that. It gets to a point where they're not used to hearing the word no. Because everything that they could ever want, all the things that they could ever need is right there in front of them. And if it's not, someone will get it for them. And this is why you see a lot of players in college, especially wrapped up in sexual assaults in rape and things of that nature because they haven't been told no. So when no, when you're not used to hearing the word no, you get a little bit of liquor or something in your system and then a, a female tells you no. You wait, wait a minute. Did you just say no to me? No, 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 no. Nobody says no to me. And that's how you find yourself in one of these sticky situations. Another thing that I, and I told you I'm a big why guy, I'm a big psychology guy, so I always try to dive in deep. Another thing you see with these athletes, let's get past the no thing, right? Another thing you see with these athletes, a lot of times, is 
there there's this cloak of invincibility that they believe exists with them. You go through middle school, into high school, you're the big man on campus, you 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 you, you front like your doo-doo don't stink, you can't be told anything. People are recruiting you here, there, everywhere. All the big schools want you. Recruits are coming to your high school to check you out, to talk to you, et cetera, et cetera. You get to college, the party don't stop. You're definitely big man on campus. Now, everything you could ask for now with NIL deals is even worse, right? Because now you got money. At least you used to be broke back in the day. Now you got money, you got girls, you got access to everything. You can get into any club you want. You can go anywhere. You can get your hands on anything. And so you're, you tell yourself, I'm untouchable. I can do anything. I'm invincible. I'm Superman. Until you meet your kryptonite. And a lot of times these guys, these athletes are adrenaline junkies too. Who doesn't like to go fast? Most human beings like to go fast. But when you are an adrenaline junkie and you think you're invincible, that's a deadly combination. Because all of a sudden now, ain't shit gonna happen to me. I'm gonna do this buck 20 and ain't no way I'm not walking away if something is to go down. But you're not even thinking like that. You're just thinking, I can do whatever because. I'm me. And because nobody is there, and a lot of times with these athletes, there's a bunch of yes men around. There's nobody there. That This is why it is important to have, you know, father figures, actual fathers, moms, people that are present in your life who will be the ones to tell you what you don't want to hear. Because too often there are too many people who are there to tell you what you want to hear. And that further perpetuates this fallacy of I'm invincible. Ain't shit going to happen to me. So if you're Henry Ruggs, you can go out here, do 140, run into a car and kill a woman and, and walk away from it. Why? Because I'm Henry Ruggs. Well, now you got to take your monkey ass to prison. Your NFL career is over. Everything you worked for is down the drain. You would think others would see that shit and go, you know what? Ain't gonna let that shit happen to me, though. But no, of course not. Because that's not the mentality. The mentality is that shit ain't gonna happen to me because that ain't me. I'm Rasheed Rice, not Henry Ruggs. I'm not going to crash. I'm not going to kill somebody. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm not going to end my career because I'm Rashi Rice. It's incredible how a lot of these guys are wired. And unfortunately, there isn't someone there to tell them, bro, this is not a good idea. You shouldn't do this. So this story is Rashid Rice rents two cars, him and his buddy race. They get into an accident that ends up causing like a six, seven car pileup. Just utter chaos. And the police body cam footage shows these clowns getting out of the accident and just leaving. Like no insurance information not checking on anybody to see if they're okay they just flee the scene like hey it's whatever i'm rashid rice who gives a shit if anybody's hurt dead whatever i'm out probably more so panic than anything else like oh shit i can't believe we just wrecked these cars let's get out of here bro they're registered to your name you don't think they're gonna find out it was you like I, I, again i watched first 48 and, and my wife, she explained to me, because she's in the she's in the teaching profession. And when you're in the education field, like she's been, and she's been at every single level. So her 
the information that she's able to provide and her perspective is top notch. She's dealt with kids at the best of schools and some of the worst of schools and everything in between. She's dealt with elementary, middle, high school, and she's been in classrooms where officers pull her out and say, hey, it's such and such in class. And she's like, yeah, all right, we about to come in and exit uh, and issue an arrest warrant um, and come and get him, put cuffs on him and walk him out of here because we charging him with murder. Like she's been in classrooms and environments like that. So when she sits there, she looks me in my face and she says, a lot of these kids don't understand the magnitude of what they do. They think they're going to commit this crime and get caught in, but they're still going home. Like they don't actually process that, bro, your life is over. Your shit is over, bro. You're not going home. There is no, hey, can I see my moms? No, none of that shit is going down. It's over. And a lot of them don't really understand that. And when you get these young ass players like Rashid Rice, who come into the league, they come into this money and they've, you know, in certain instances, I think this is going to change. You hope it does with these NIL deals, but a lot of them didn't have money. So they, they come into money and now all of a sudden, all the things that they never had an opportunity to get or do, they have that now at their disposal. <laughs> You just wish they made better decisions. You wish that guys didn't see these opportunities that they are being presented with playing a, a game that they've essentially worked their entire lives to get to this level to play, to be paid to do it. You would love to see them not waste and squander this opportunity. And look, I say this. There are many, there are so more got so many more guys that do things the right way, that are a part of charitable organizations, that give back to the community. There's so more, many more of those than there are knuckleheads like Rashid Rice and Henry Ruggs and guys who throw it all away. There's so many more that are doing great things and positive things in the community. They just don't get as much attention. Because negativity and things that are shocks to our system are the things that are headlines that people gravitate towards. But this is not new behavior. Rashid Rice is just the latest in the example of players who think they're invincible, players who are reckless with their behavior, but their attitudes towards others. Because he, he gave him two shits about who else was in that rap. I read a, I read an article where a lady who was in there with her four-year-old son who ended up in that in that wreck. His whole side, like one side of his body was like completely like sore. Like he could barely move and he was, he had like the, the tremors for like two days straight where he couldn't sit still. His body was just uncontrollably shaking. Luckily, Nobody passed away. Nobody died. Or he'd be in a Henry Ruggs type situation. There's eight felony counts out on Rashid Rice right now. The likelihood is, and this is another thing, and I'm not a big make an example out of somebody type of guy, right? That's not normally how I operate. Certain, you know, certain circumstances do facilitate Hey, make an example out of his stupid ass, right? They should have made an example out of George Zimmerman's dumb ass, right? Certain instances should require make an example out of this clown. I, I don't, I don't like being that guy unless the circumstances are extreme. This is rising to the level of bro. What the hell are we doing here? And don't know his history. Don't know if he's done stupid shit in the past. Is this habitual behavior or is this the first time he's done something crazy like this? All I know is it shouldn't take Jalen Carter racing and ended up in a situation where his teammate gets in an accident and dies. 
it shouldn't take Jamin Davis and DeShazer Everett racing and an accident ensues in which DeShazer Everett's girlfriend dies. It shouldn't take Henry Ruggs drunk on his ass, doing a buck 40, crashing into a helpless lady, killing her and her pet for people to wake up. It shouldn't take all of these instances for people to understand right is right, wrong is wrong, and you shouldn't be out here doing stupid shit that endangers the lives of others. But this is what happens when these athletes are coddled to from the time that people realize they have talent, they're catered to, they don't hear the word no, they're, they're put into this bubble and made to feel invincible. I can do anything. I'm me. This is the end result. When that behavior isn't curtailed somewhere along the way. And Rashi Rice is just the latest um, example of a player who simply didn't get it. Simply just doesn't get it. Doesn't value human life. Doesn't feel like he's going. And, and the audacity, and this is the part that kind of pisses you off. The audacity, look, you effed up. The audacity to walk away as if you didn't just cause this shit to happen. Flee the scene. And have people looking for you as if you didn't leave the Kansas City Chiefs playbook in the vehicle. As if you didn't leave the scene and these two cars are registered in your name. Like, they're not going to find out who the hell just did this and is responsible. That's the, the shit that I was talking about. My wife telling me where they don't understand the consequences of their behavior. They don't understand that, bro, you're in some serious shit here. And your attorney telling us, oh, well, my client made a mistake and he shouldn't be judged on his one mistake. I hear you. But he's got to pay for this shit. Ultimately, we'll see what happens, what becomes of these eight felony counts that he's uh, currently being charged with. We'll see what the league decides to do. Usually they let these things play out before they slap him with the suspension. We'll see how everything kind of goes. The Chiefs have been mum on this whole situation. If we recall, I, I hate to bring other people into situations that they have nothing to do with, but of all teams, right? Kansas City Chiefs, Andy Reid's son, you know, drunk on his ass, hits a kid on the side of the road you know, um, or hits a, a car that has a kid in it um, that goes into a coma the week of the Super Bowl. We all know that situation. So of all teams that this could happen to, there should be a little bit more of a, of a hard line stance if you're the Kansas City Chiefs. Because of the things that you've gone through as an organization already in a similar situation. But we'll see what they do. I hate to see young men throw everything that they've worked so hard for away doing stupid shit. But these are the choices that you as an athlete have to make. And you have to live with the results. It, my guess is, depending on how, who, what kind of a judge he gets, is going to ultimately determine his fate. You get one of these hard-ass judges that wants to make an example out of you, he could be in some, some serious trouble here. He could see some jail time, potentially to go to prison, and could see his NFL career be in jeopardy. You get one of these judges that's a little bit more lenient, And, you know, Rashid Rice is proactive and his lawyers should be very proactive. They should be reaching out to the families that were affected. He should be going through, you know, uh, training classes and uh, showing all of the, the things that he needs to show to, to make everyone believe this will never happen again, right? Being remorseful. Sorry. Um, we'll see. 
my gut tells me it'll be a slap on the wrist, a significant fine. He'll be sued in civil court. He'll have to pay damages there. And the league will step in. They'll slap a, a suspension on him at some point. But he'll be fine. That's what it feels like. Because no, there were no casualties. That's what's going to ultimately save him here. Is there were no casualties. Athletes generally get the benefit of the doubt when nobody dies. It's as crazy as that sounds. Man, I hope others are taking notes. That's all, all I ever hope with these situations is that other people are taking notice. Other players, other athletes are watching these situations closely and saying, hey, I got to make sure that I don't do some stupid shit like that. Unfortunately, that's that's usually not how it goes. If that's how your brain is wired, where you're an adrenaline junkie, you want to go fast and you think you're invincible, you're not going to think about what Rashid Rice just did. You're not going to think about what DeShazer ever did. You're not going to think about what... Henry Ruggs did. You're not going to think about Jalen Carter and what they were doing at the university. You're not going to think about any of those situations because I'm not them. I'm me. And that shit's not going to happen to me. You're more likely to think that way than you are. I don't want that shit to happen to me. So I'm not even going to put myself in that position. And that is the part of this that really pisses me off. But again, you can only do so much. There's only so much talking that can be done, you know. Decisions are going to be made ultimately. As a parent, all you can ever do is try to instill those values or as a, a as a father figure or just as a person that is important in someone's life, all you can do is try to instill the right values and, and qualities in a, another human being. That's very impressionable. You would like to be able to have your words of wisdom resonate. Well, you just, you never know. You just never know if in that moment of truth, when somebody says, hey man, you know what we should do? We should rent a couple of Lambos and race. You would hope in that moment, they go, nah, man, I, I got too much to lose. I can't do that shit. You would hope that that would be the response. Clearly, that was not, you know. And then some of these friends, I struggle with some of these dudes too. Like, if that's my man's right there, and I know what he's worth, not just to himself, but to me, okay? Like, if I'm a tag along, but that's my guy, like we grew up together, that's my best friend, I'm gonna make sure I do everything in my power to not let him destroy everything that I watched him work so damn hard for, i.e. John ja Morant, right? Like, I know his situation. There's no way I'm going to let this man have another gun on IG Live while I'm with him. I don't care how drunk we get. I don't care how high we get. Ain't no way I'm going to let you turn your phone on and go live when I know we got a gun in the car, whether it's yours or mine. But again... It's, it's just, it's hard for me to find because my brain doesn't work that way. Your brain doesn't work that way. So we can't put ourselves in their shoes because we don't think the way that they think. It's just tough, man. It's just tough. Is that, that it's a tough, bitter pill to swallow. I'm going to tell you the shit that's really going to ultimately piss people off is that, that body cam of them jokers just walking away. Not giving a damn about... The, the, the safety of any of the people that got in these accidents because of them, mind you, this happened because of them just walking away. Like they didn't do that. Like they had nothing to do with it. That's the shit that's going to turn people off and be like, you know what? Throw his ass under the damn jail. So anyway, I digress. It's I've seen this so many times and I've been around guys that had this attitude towards others. Like, you know who I am? Almost like 
he was invincible or he couldn't be touched because he knew that his path was a little bit different than everybody else's. I know I'm talented. I know where I'm going. Why are you even talking to me right now? That kind of attitude. That's when this shit gets scary. I've been a lot around guys who, who were very humble. And I've been around guys who have been just as pompous and arrogant. And you could see the 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 writing on the wall. And I, I got stories. I could tell y'all stories. I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to put people's business out here in these streets. But I could tell you stories. And the same guy that I'm talking about ended up getting in trouble for some shit down the road. And you see that kind of stuff. But that's nor here nor there. Uh, I digress. Let's get to social media maneuvers. Y'all know what it is. I'm a midday marauder. If y'all are out there, want your comments to be read, um, y'all know how this works. Use the hashtag Louis T Live to have your comment read on the air if it is pertinent and time permits, we will get to it. Um, also, if you want to ensure that your comment is read, super chats are the best way to ensure that that gets done. So by all means, please make sure that you super chat if you want to ensure that your comment is read on the air. We'll see if you guys have anything to add to this discussion or anything else we've talked about today or something totally um, non-related to anything we've talked about today. Uh, let's get to the comment section. And we start off with Ghost Rider, who writes, the Chiefs haven't had a good, uh, haven't had good wide receivers since Tyreek left. Um, that's not true. Juju Smith Schuster was there for one year. Now I'm not telling you he was great, but for that one year, he was very solid for them and helped them win a Super Bowl. right? He did what he needed to do to help them reach the pinnacle. Um, last year was rough because they signed MVS a couple of years ago, hoping he would fill that deep threat speed void and, uh, it was a disaster last year in particular. The year before, not so much. It was okay. Last year, he dropped a lot of passes. He came up small, and uh, they didn't have the kind of production out of him. That's why they cut him this year with a year left on his contract. Um, Rashid Rice was the best receiver that they've had since Tyreek Hill, um, since Juju Smith-Schuster left. He was the best receiver that they've had. And he led all receivers on their team by a wide margin and postseason receptions. He had 26 catches during the postseason last year. Um, so he was huge for the chiefs. They don't win the super bowl without him. And, you know, it's pretty disappointing to see, you know, the decision that he made here and uh, ultimately we'll see how, how much it costs him. Right. Um, John Wynn says April Fool's Day prank on Seahawks wide receiver Tyler Lockett at Kansas City Chiefs got me completely disgusted. I didn't even see that. I haven't, I haven't participated in April Fool's in a long time. I even forgot April Fool's existed. Um, somebody could have gotten me really good on April 1st because I forgot it was April Fool's Day. <laughs> it's just hard to get me because my antennas are always up these days because there's so many trolls on socials now. Like today, for instance, um, I open my phone up. I see Adam Schefter's name. I see the um, alert, right? The um, the sirens, and it, it, you know, which usually is a dead giveaway because I don't know if Adam Schefter does that on his post or not. But I don't think I saw that one. I think there was one that looked like an Adam Schefter post. It was even worded like Adam Schefter, and it was a Brandon Ayuk trait, right? Had the same um, little. Uh, imagery that Schefter has, you know, his thumbnails always look the same where it, it says breaking news at the bottom with the little red and the white. And uh, there's a picture there and, and it had his little, you know, thumbnail of him and Mort. Um, and then it had Adam Schefter, but then you always got to look at the, the handle. Right. And it was at some random shit from, you know, Steeler fan shit. So you knew, okay, this is bogus, but uh, so many people troll these days, try to get you. Um, it's really nasty how people work. Like, I don't know what they're looking to gain because if you do that enough, people are just going to stop 
paying attention to you, but it's enough clowns out there that'll still follow you regardless. So people do stuff like that. Aha, I got you. Um, Robert Griffin III got got a couple weeks ago, I think, when he was talking about Caleb Williams and then somebody who was acting as Caleb Williams responded to him and he thought it was Caleb Williams. And, you know, and you can get got real easily if you real, um, if you trash with your um, investigative skills, right? If, if you don't do the, the simplest of checks, you can get got real easy. So it's hard to get me because I'm, my guard is always up. Ever since luck started getting me on YouTube and then I saw how nasty people work on social media, I just always assume, unless it's coming from the tightest, airtight of sources, right? It's got to be the tightest of tight, airtight sources. Schefter, Rappaport, you know, Jesse uh, 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 Palmer, uh, Garofolo, one of these dudes that works for one of these major networks, Breer. It got to be one of these guys. If it ain't one of these dudes, miss me with all of that. I'm just not buying it, right? Because it's too many people out there trying to get you with an aha and laugh in your face. So you, I, I know you're young, so you're very susceptible. They're targeting your audience, right? People like you, you got to be safe out here. I told you, it's not safe on these streets, man. Be careful. Ghost Rider says, my prayer goes out to Nicole Brown's family. Um, yeah. I mean, you said that like she just passed away, <laughs> you know, two days ago or last week. Uh, I But I guess in him passing away, her name is going to get drudged up. And, you know, and I, I would assume that it's painful every time that that happens, I would guess. Um, John Wayne writes, if you live in D.C., why can't you be a Wizards fan instead of being a, a Grizzlies fan? I mean, why are people fans of the teams that they ultimately are fans of? That's essentially what you're asking me. Like, just because I live in an area doesn't mean I have to be a fan of that team that I grew up in, right? I didn't grow up in D.C., so it's a little bit different for me. I grew up in Virginia, and I didn't grow up in the DMV area. So there was no attachment to any of the local teams. We didn't have local teams. All right. The local baseball team was the Norfolk Tides. Okay. That was that was baseball to us. Okay. That's a triple A affiliate. That's not an actual major league baseball team, by the way. I know most of you know that, but there's some of you that don't. Um, we didn't have a, a an NBA team and we don't have an NBA team in Virginia. We tried to get one once upon a time. We don't have an actual NFL team. The closest thing was the Washington Redskins. So, again, I've gone through the story of how I became a fan of all the teams I've become a fan of. Uh, but if if um, if I had grown up closer to D.C., maybe I would have become uh, a Wizards fan. Or back then it would have been the Bullets. But I didn't. So, anyway. I digress. Um, Steel City says, Lou, I watched the Brian Thomas highlight tape and he was running by everyone. It was crazy. Um, <laughs> Brian Thomas, Brian Thomas. Was that the linebacker? They got uh, falsely accused of rape. Is that him? Or am I thinking of somebody else? Refresh my memory. Who is Brian Thomas? John Wynn says, with the new rules on kickoffs, how are they going to do the onside kicks? There are no onside kicks. Remember, uh, that's one of the things that you lose, the surprise onside kick, rather. Um, you essentially have to announce what it is you're trying to do. So in late game situations, the team knows you're kicking an onside kick so they can prepare. Um, but as far as surprise onside kicks, those are dead. Those are not. Um, those are no longer uh, within the rules of the game. You're going to incur a penalty and the ball is going to come out to like the 40 or 45 yard line if that happens. So those are dead now. Steel City. Um, 
writes, Lou, my Steelers need a tackle, but I am pretty sure all the good ones are going to be gone after round one. I don't want uh, Suamai Taia or Kieran. I want Guyton, Mims, or Lathan. So it's probably round one. Yeah, you're going to have to get one in round one if you want one of those top tier guys. I, like you, am not blown away by the second tier of tackles, but in the position that we're in, we don't have a choice. Um, you just got to try to – this is where your scouting department comes into play, and you got to find the guy that best suits your scheme and fits what it is you're trying to do and hope you get lucky with one of these second, third, or fourth. That's where we are. That's not where you are. You're in the perfect position to get you one of these dudes. Um, it's going to come at the expense of you being able to draft something else, but if tackle is what you need, which you do need a tackle, um, then you need to make that happen, right? If, if you're going to go out and trade for Justin Fields, if you're going to bring in Russell Wilson, you need to protect those investments and give them a fighting chance to be successful. So um, I'm with you. I want one of those elite tier tackles. If I'm in a position like the Steelers are to, to get one of those guys, I, I don't think um, that you should pass up on that opportunity. I think you need to, need to make that happen. I, I know what's being said, and I'm going to talk about that tonight on the commander on the command post live about these positions in the draft because I think there are uh, some misnomers that are being uh, put out there in the atmosphere. At least from my perspective, you know, yes, the tackle position is deep, but deep and quality and quantity are two different things. I think people get those two things mixed up a lot of times. Like the receiver uh, crop in this year's class is not only deep, but it's also talented. So there's quality and quantity. That's a rare thing, right? You generally don't get those two components in a draft at a particular position. You can get one or the other. High level quality early, um, and then it falls off of a cliff, or you get, um, you know, Maybe there's no real standouts, but it's a lot of good players, right? A lot of qu quantity, right? Um, you got both at receiver. At tackle, I think there is high-level quality early, and then there's quantity throughout. Don't confuse the two. So if you're if you're looking for a plug-and-play starter, and you drafted one last year, right? The kid from Georgia didn't start immediately. Um, Chuck's a core four got into some issues, got benched. He ended up playing, played well. So you feel like you got yourself a guy. Now you need another one, right? Go get you another tackle. Now you got bookends and now you don't have to worry about it for the next five to seven years. Um, John Wynn says, if Rashid somehow gets caught due to speed racing in Dallas, is he allowed to play the Chiefs Super Bowl home opener banner um, this season? <laughs> don't know. We don't know how any of this is going to play out. The likelihood is <clears throat> it just depends on how people feel. If if people have the fake outrage, oh, my God, and they act woke and they, they beat up the NFL, they may try to suspend him, right? or put him on one of these lists that makes him ineligible to play while the league continues to see this investigation through. But a lot of times with situations like this that happen in the offseason, the NFL usually takes a laissez-faire approach where their hands are off until the justice system uh, plays itself out, the legal system plays itself out. And then after all of that has met a resolution, then the NFL steps in and, and weighs in on the situation. So, um, my guess is yes, he'll be available for week one. Barring the Chiefs having, you know, their own um, form of punishment, which usually doesn't happen with these teams. And no other developments coming out and him pretty much staying out of trouble the rest of the way, I'd assume that he'll be available come the start of the season. And really probably all season long. I don't think we'll hear anything more about this until next year, until next off season where they might, you know, start pushing the, the proceedings forward. So uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, let's see. Um,
Captain Flobnart, why is it if you want the commanders to draft a certain QB, you have to bash the other prospects because you don't like them? It's corny to me. That's been a lot of my stances. Like, that's what caused the Civil War, essentially, is that because they want one quarterback, they have to then demean the other to elevate the quarterback that they like. And that's that it doesn't have to be that way. And that's what I've advocated for. Like, you can say, I prefer Jaden Daniels and say, but Drake May is cool, but I just like Jaden Daniels more and leave it at that. You don't have to then proceed to Drake May is this and he's not that and he can't do this. And if you like him, you're crazy and you you don't have to do all of that. But people aren't mature enough to just say, hey, I prefer this guy over this guy and leave it at that. They have to then bash the other guy to elevate. And we see that all the time. It's not just this situation. It's it's in anything. If you like one rapper, then you got to shit on the other rapper to elevate the guy that you like, right? You like this movie, so you got to shit on this movie and pick this movie apart to elevate the movie that you like. People do it all the time. It's human nature. I just don't understand why you have to do that. Especially when we're talking about two players each of which could end up on your team and you might have to root for them. That's the shit that is mind boggling. If you're talking about an entity who has no feelings, you know, who has no emotions, sure, do what you want to do. If you're talking about two movies, fine. I don't care. One movie isn't going to be sad or isn't going to feel some type of way because you're bashing it to elevate the other one. It's a thing, right? We're talking about two human beings. We're talking about two people. We're talking about two players. Like a lot of times, People fail to realize that we're talking about humans, people. You can't just say anything and act as if these players are immune to the things that are being said about them. This is insane how people conduct themselves. It's ridiculous. Now, it's going to be what it's going to be, which is why I don't even waste my breath anymore. I just went inside where it's safe. It's warm, it's it's cozy, and I'm away from harm until all of this is done. Just go inside and relax. Um, Ghost Rider says, QBs will have visits with the team uh, next week. Yep, that is, the in fact, the case. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh let's see now i see a, a mean wrestling conversation is being had right now <laughs> uh steel city both of these LSU receivers were insane. Random thought, but I feel like if neighbors fell to seven, Callahan would feel like he's watching Jamar Chase clone and they run to the podium. Could be. Um, if you're the Titans, though, and I, I guess you could, it's twofold because maybe that's in fact the case. With his dad being there, maybe your dad is able to sell you on, hey, we can get an offensive lineman later and I can clean him up. Go do what you need to do with receiver. Or his dad is like, bro, give me one of these, give me one of these studs and I'm gonna turn him into an all pro. Like the choice is yours. Um, they need weapons in Tennessee, but I think it's less likely that the Titans do that because remember, they signed Calvin Ridley to a deal where I think they overpaid, paid, but that's not here nor there. They signed Calvin Ridley, and they still have um, uh, DeAndre Hopkins. So I, I don't think they're in the market for a receiver at seven, to be honest with you. Um, it, had they not gotten Calvin Ridley, I think that would be more in play. So uh, my guess is whether Neighbors is there at seven or not, they're going to take the tackle. I think that's where the Titans are right now. And that's probably where they should be, knowing that you got a young quarterback. There's no more Derrick Henry. You did go out and sign 
uh, Tony Pollard, but you're going to need to run the ball. You're going to need to protect that quarterback and give him the time that he needs. Uh, I think they're going to go ahead. And, and they've always, one thing I can say about the Titans, and I know it's a different regime now, they've always valued the offensive line. They've always spent resources and, and replenished that offensive line. And, and over the last two off seasons, they've lost a lot of talent up front. And I, I think they're going to continue. They, they drafted a guy in the first round last year. You could argue the best offensive lineman in last year's draft. And they have a chance to do it again this year. And I, I don't think they're going to pass on that opportunity two years in a row. I think they're going to make the same decision they made last year and invest up front on that offensive line. But uh, again, we will see. Um, Reedy Davis, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. Um, Reedy writes, Lou, I know these young kids don't get it, but they should make penalties steep for dumb stuff. Yeah, it's it's a fine line you walk. Um, because on one end, I want to see them punished. I want them to be held accountable for their actions. That's what I teach the youth of America. You know, anybody that's close to me is you got to be accountable for the shit that you do. You know, uh, my, my son is five. And, and one of the things that we're teaching him actively right now is he's got to be accountable. You know, you do this, this is the penalty. Like, you can't slam your tablet down and expect there to be no penalty for you slamming your tablet down because it's time to take a bath or because we told you to go clean this up or clean that up and you get mad. Now, there's consequences to your actions. You're going to be held accountable for slamming that tablet down. And he's got to learn that at a young age. And as he grows, the, the penalties will become steeper because the things that he does are going to be more severe than just slamming a tablet down, right? And he's got to learn that too. The more severe the infraction, the more steep the consequences are. And I I am a, a, a big proponent of making people accountable for their actions. And... I struggle with it because, again, Rosh, for all I know, and I, nothing that he has done in this situation points to this, and I don't know him, again, so I can't vouch for him. He might be a really good kid that made a stupid, dumb mistake, right? And let's just assume that that's the case. Do you really want to Do you really want to penalize him uh, for that? where he could actually turn and be an advocate for not doing stupid shit? Or do you say, no, I, I don't care if you're a good kid. You made a, a reckless decision that put people's lives in danger and you have to pay for this. And that's that. Again, again, it's a fine line. I wouldn't be opposed to looking at it from all you know angles in both perspectives. I'm open to whatever. Every situation is unique and it's different. And so um, not every case is the same. Some people deserve to be punished harshly because they have a track record. And this is behavior that they've exhibited since they were a teenager or since they were, you know, um, minors. Uh, and then some guys have never been in trouble. They made one poor decision. And again, depending on the severity of the infraction, I think you should go accordingly, but it, it, it this it's tough. But yeah, I, I I don't disagree necessarily with uh, making the penalty somewhat steep, you know, because what you're hoping that it does is it acts as a deterrent to others. But my thing is, if Henry Ruggs destroying his career and his throwing his life away and 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 really destroying another family's you know situation by ending another human life if that's not enough to get you to understand the, the magnitude of what's going down when you decide to get in a car and and drive it at ridiculous rates of speed if you don't understand what that can do i don't know what else to say to you i really truly don't Reedy Davis, thank you um, 
for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Reed writes, can we stop guessing about the number two pick until the draft? I, I'm not guessing. I, I don't, I mean, you could be talking to the rest of the fan base. When have I guessed? I mean, only, only when somebody asks me, do I respond, but I don't talk. I don't even really talk, talk about the quarterback position anymore. If you've been watching my channel, you know, I, I said my piece and I moved on. I really don't have much to say about it. I only talk about it when, when you guys bring it up. Because they're going to do what they ultimately decide to do. And whatever they decide to do, I'm going to support it. Even if it's J.J. McCarthy, I may not like it and I may bitch and complain about it initially. But eventually, I got to get on board. What are you going to do? Right? Sean Moore. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. My guy, Sean, writes. What to do, Lou? What's going on, Sean? I'm just now getting on because I left the stadium getting my season tickets. But are you on again tonight at 9? Yes, I am, Sean. I'll be on live tonight. This is our normal spot on Thursday nights unless I have something um, already scheduled for Thursday. You know, during the season, so let me explain this to you because I think you're relatively new, which I, I really appreciate you jumping on board and supporting the movement, man. Um, can't thank you enough for your support. So in the off season, my live show is the command post and it's every Thursday night. Now the times vary from 8.30 to 9.30, but it's usually somewhere in that neighborhood, depending on how busy I am that day, uh, how you know the home life is going, and then also how in depth that particular episode is. Does it require me to do even more work where it may push the show back and I need that extra time to prepare? Uh, but it's always Thursday during the off season and it's always somewhere in that uh, 8 30 to 9 30 range normally it's 9 or 9 30 uh, but in during the season obviously there's Thursday night football games so I'm not going to step on its toes and I'm watching that because I have a show to do directly thereafter so the Washington show which is then um, the um, commander's nightly news is moved to Wednesday night at usually somewhere between 8 30 and 9 30 p so um yes i am live tonight i think the time i set it for is nine o'clock and i will be live and we will be talking washington commanders we will be talking nfl draft and how it pertains to washington and i got a lot to say about washington's official 30 visits shit's heating up Birdman hand rub but we'll get to that later on tonight hopefully you'll be able to join me um let's see where did we leave off at uh right here legendary one writes i also think it's a lot of overlooking jj mccarthy not saying he's the best but to say he relies on the run game and had a good defense is like duh that's what you want it yeah but also um you want a guy that can carry you if need be. I, he hasn't shown that. That's the issue is um, he was carried literally by their run game and Edwards and Corum on the ground and then a ferocious defense that was the best in the nation. Um, again, yeah, you do want those things to be complimentary and you want your quarterback to make timely throws on third down. And he did that, right? Nobody's taking that away from him. But in the NFL, it's rare to see a team win strictly off of good ground game and uh, a dominant defense. The 49ers have tried and failed multiple times, okay? Others have tried and failed. The Titans have tried and failed, right? The Ravens have tried and failed. You're going to win in this league. Your quarterback better be able to make big time throws and carry you if need be in some crucial situations if you're going to win a Super Bowl. Running game and really good defense will get you to the playoffs. We've seen that formula work. Browns, Titans, Ravens, 49ers, etc. We've seen that work. And none of those teams won a Super Bowl, though. And you're not going to win a Super Bowl unless your quarterback 
is capable of attaching a team to his back and carrying them if need be, right? I'm not saying that you need your quarterback to do that every single week, but I've watched J.J. McCarthy, and my issue with J.J. is his mindset up here. And you it's hard to rewire the way a guy sees the game. He's a safe quarterback by nature. And that's fine. Again, that's going to work for somebody. And there are teams that value taking care of the football, taking a profit so you don't go broke and staying ahead of the sticks. There are teams that value that decision-making process. However, I want the guy that looks deep to short, not short to deep. Okay. I want the guy that wants the big ball first. And then if it's not there, he comes back and goes underneath. J.J. McCarthy is looking to get rid of the football hot potato style, i.e. Alex Smith, instead of looking. I see guys running down the field wide open. I'm like, bro, that's a 55-yard gain. If you want it, you got one-on-one with a guy streaking across the field on a big post, and he's running away from that defender. Let it rip. Now I'm going to take this tight end underneath for an 11-yard gain because it's safe. That's no way to live in the NFL. You can get away with that in the Big Ten playing against Illinois, playing against Indiana. You can get away with that playing against those teams. You'll survive doing that. You're not going to survive in the NFL doing that. I'm not telling you he can't play ball. I'm just telling you I want the guy with a more aggressive demeanor and mindset. Kirk Warner talks about it all the time. Certain guys look to be aggressive and attack down the field and others look to survive to the next play. I don't want the guy looking to survive to the next play. There's a time and a place for that. You're in a bad play. The defense one has won that rep. Get rid of it. Survive a bad play. But when there are options and you decide to take the safer one, that just doesn't sit right with me. So. Yeah. I digress, however. <laughs> anyway. Um, Ghost Rider. Um, writes, I think others who are saying Jaden Daniels is a locket too is a smoke screen. Um, I think people who are saying that, a lot of people want him to be the picket too. Um, at the end of the day, nobody knows anything. So Adam Schefter doesn't have any reason to be pro providing a smokescreen for anybody. Uh, the reason guys like Adam Schefter, Colin Cowherd, and others speak about these topics is because this, this is what they get paid to do, to have an opinion, to, to give you a take based off of information that they've gathered, whether right or wrong. But in the case of Washington, nobody knows anything. So you're essentially guessing. It's all conjecture. That's what it is. Nobody knows anything. So you can tell me based off of my sources. What sources? Who's talked to you? Because don't nobody know nothing. So again, you can project based off of what Cliff Kingsbury likes. And I think a lot of people here with one of my biggest pet peeves in this industry that we're in is people hear what they want to hear. They don't, they don't. And again, I, there's a difference between listening and hearing. And, and there's a lost art in listening. A lot of people hear shit, but they don't listen. And I think people have it confused between the two. Hearing is hearing is the, the ability to have noise pipe into your ears and, and be able to discern where that noise is coming from. You may not be able to actually know what is being said, but you can hear where that noise is coming from. Audibly, you should be able to say, hey, I hear two people talking over there about 10 yards away. That's hearing. You don't know what they're talking about because if you did, you're listening. Now you ear hustling. That's different. Now you listening. You can listen for content. 
Now I can tell you what they're talking about. That's listening and comprehend. When you read for comprehension, that's the equivalent of listening, okay? That's a lost art. People hear shit, run with it. Oh, Colin Cowherd said this. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. But I heard a lot of him talking about what Cliff Kingsbury likes. And he's essentially basing his decision and his prediction at two off of the staff and what he thinks they're going to do. But people will go and say, well, Cowherd said he's going to. He's got sources. Does he really? Adam Schefter has said multiple times, I don't have any sources. This is what I think they're going to do. And then he gives you reasons as to why he's basing his, you know, opinion off of what. But it's his opinion. He's not going at this with the the from an angle of my sources tell me. But yet that's what people are going with, as if Adam Schefter is reporting something. He said multiple times, I don't have, he said, I can't even call this an educated guess because I'm not educated enough. I don't have enough information. This is what I think they're leaning towards. And here's why. And again, all people go back to is Cliff Kingsbury's history with quarterbacks. They're usually mobile. They're guys that get it out of their hands quickly, et cetera, et cetera. And so all signs point to Jaden Day. It is what it is. Uh, I, I've said this. Um, I can't even count how many times. There's no reason for a smoke screen at two when you already know what number one's going to do. So this whole anybody that uses the word smoke screen and involves that with the number two pick, I immediately tune them out because the two aren't synonymous and they don't go together when you already know what number one is going to do. The only way Washington would be essentially posing, right, is if they're trying to coax somebody to come up. They don't want to trade out of number two. If they wanted out of two, they could get out of two. They don't, they don't need to do anything, is my point. Unless you're trying to coax a team like New England up from three to two so you can move back one and get a quarterback and you want new England to think, Hey, I'm going to take this guy. If you don't want him, if you don't come up and get him, I'm going to take him. That's the only, that's the only way there would be posturing on the part of Washington. They don't need to posture. Mega four, one, two. Right. Did you hear about the reports of Drake May being able to call his own protections at the line based on what he's seen from the defense? Yeah, I heard that very early in the process. I don't I haven't confirmed that, but I've heard that multiple times early on in the process that he was given full autonomy at the line of scrimmage to be able to set his protections, you know, based off of the defensive looks that he were, he was getting and things of that nature, which was another reason why early in the process when people would try to compare him to Sam Howell, there was a distinct difference. Sam was not built and equipped with that knowledge coming into the league, right? And a lot of people were like, no, Drake May is a little bit different. So uh, again, I can't confirm that. I'm just telling you, I've heard the same thing. I've heard the same thing. Booker writes, the team talked about doing things the right way, not taking the shortcut. That could lend to the team developing a more raw quarterback than taking Mr. Half Decade. Again, I'm not here for the name calling, although it is crazy that he was in school for five years um, or he played college football for five years. But um, at the end of the day, yes, I think there have been subtle, you know, hints maybe dropped. Again, this is what we do, right? We draw inferences and I do think there have been quotes from the, the owner, Josh Harris, uh, the GM, uh, Adam Peters, and the head coach, Dan Quinn, that have suggested that 
Drake May could be the pick, but then you could also look at it from a different perspective and look at it and say the same thing about Jaden Daniels. So, you know, it's really hard to say. Uh, Captain Flobnart writes, all of these analysts with inside um, are just trying to stretch out content and form something out of nothing, LOL. Peter's got it locked down like Fort Knox. Yeah. Nobody has anything. That's why I've, I've been pretty much adamant when I've said over and over again, don't allow anybody to try to sell you on the fact that they know what Washington is going to do as if they've got some sort of insider information or they've got some contacts. This is the thing. Nobody has contacts within that building anymore. If this were last year's group, if this were the group before that, there were plenty of people that had moles and spies and contacts within the building. And yeah, there would be a lot of information being disseminated. And you could say, yeah, that, that it, this person probably knows what they're talking about because somebody's feeding them information that has been feeding them information. There's nobody in that group now feeding anybody anything because it's a totally different building now. So yeah, I, I, um, I don't buy that. And again, we're we're two weeks out. We're two weeks out. So just gonna continue to to chill. I'm not even riding the roller coaster anymore. I'm just chilling at this point. Uh Captain Flobnart writes, didn't you not want Deron Payne? Uh yeah, I did I didn't want him. There were other guys, and look, I still stand firm on how I felt then. Um but I'm glad that he turned out to be a really good player. But there were other guys in that draft that I wanted that turned out to be really good players too. And I think they're all kind of on the same playing field. And all of them have gotten paid. Have all have gotten second contracts. All have played really well. So they did good by getting Deron Payne. But I was adamant I didn't want him. Then we had just taken Jonathan out in the year before. I didn't think we needed to double down on defensive tackle, but I'm not complaining about it now. You know, now look at him. Just let Adam cook, and that's I've been uh, I've been adamant about Chef P. Just let him cook. Just let him cook. Ghost Rider says one of the rookie QBs they'll draft at two. We'll have to face Washington's improved defense at training camp. Uh, I don't think I, I comprehend what you're saying. Oh, okay. One of these rookies that they draft will have to play against Washington's defense and practice every day is what you're saying. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, that's cool. But at the end of the day, I'm more concerned with how he's adjusting to whatever it is they're asking him to digest. And, you know, because a lot of times in camp, you're it, it, you're not going ones against ones a ton. And when you do, that's cool to see. But a lot of the looks are basic in, in camp. They're not throwing like exotic looks at you and trying to confuse you. It's usually a, a, a some form of some basic coverage, and you just got to do a good job of deciphering it early and knowing where to go with the football. Like that's what they're kind of testing you on. Um, and they're going to try to confuse you with making it look like something else, this, that, and, uh, and the third. But, you know, it's not going to be anything crazy. But, yeah, I mean, it, that never hurts, especially if the defense is good. How many years, though, have we gone into camp and the defense is doing this, that, and the third. And we, oh, and people are going crazy for the defense. Oh, this defense is going to be crazy. And then the defense is trash. So we'll see. I, I got more confidence in this group than I have any other group. I'll say that much. But I digress. Uh, let's get to our final segment of the show and garbage time. So, um, The NFL 
uh, recently released a statement saying that this upcoming season, they would allow a third alternate helmet. So remember, they just released the shackles off of teams like two years ago that started allowing teams to wear an alternate helmet. You know how funny it would look when Tampa Bay would wear their creamsicle uniforms, but then they'd have to wear their traditional helmet, right? And it just, if you can't wear the helmet that goes with that uniform, then what good is it? You know, the Broncos would wear their orange crush uniforms, which are among the, the nastiest and sickest in the league, but they'd have to wear their, you know, regular Broncos helmet. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't hit the same as the, the big D on the helmet with the Bronco with the shining light coming out of it, right? Pause. It doesn't hit the same. You know, seeing them rock those helmets the last two years with Russell Wilson, it hits different, right? Hits different when you see Brady in the creamsicle unis with the actual Buccaneer logo, with the Buccaneer who looks a little sus, with the knife in his mouth blinking, but it, it, they go hard, right? Watching Seattle on, I think it was Thursday night against the Cowboys this year. I think it was Thursday night football. If I'm not mistaken, it was either Thursday or Monday. Whatever it was, watching them wear those glorious kingdom throwbacks. Oh, my stars with the throwback silver helmet. What? Like, it hits different when um, it's done correctly. And so the NFL allowed that to happen a couple of years ago. Now, you, you look at them offering up a third option to teams. Now. Uh, it, of course, it doesn't come without stipulations. So um, the first stipulation, if you are to have a third helmet design, right? The first stipulation is you have to be going through a redesign process for the upcoming season. So essentially, Nike has to be doing some sort of retooling to your current uniforms, right? So if this is in fact the case and they're not done yet, you can then have a third helmet. Now, um, how many teams are going to actually have that at their disposal? Not many, because again, not many teams are going to be going through uh, changes to any of their uniforms. However, a team like the Commanders could easily have another helmet if they want, because we got like 60 different combinations that we could put together and they could tweak the uniforms. And I remember Jason Wright saying when the, the Commanders first became a thing, that they were going to have another alt uniform and then that could lead to another, you know, helmet, et cetera, et cetera. So who knows, right? But um, the next thing is that th the helmets must be historically compatible with colors and designs of the classic uniforms if paired together. So you can't be the Atlanta Falcons going through a sl slight tweak with your uniform and decide that you're going to have a, a silver helmet. The Falcons have never had silver be in a part of any of their color schemes throughout the years. It's always been black, red, and white. It's never been silver. So you can't all of a sudden introduce a silver helmet, right? Uh, again, I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. I, I don't think you're going to see the now... I guess you could say it from this standpoint, everybody's going to some sort of a blackout uniform and, and helmet. So if you're Seattle, you can't have an all black helmet because you've never had black be a part of your color scheme. Even though you may want to introduce a blackout uniform, that's never been one of your colors. It's not a part of your color scheme. Hence, you cannot have a blackout helmet, right? A blackout, a black helmet rather. So that's essentially what they're guarding against. Like you can't just come with some random color helmet that doesn't fit the classic look of your uniforms. And also to add into that, these helmets, that third helmet can be paired with your authorized classic uniform. So the, the creamsicle or the kingdom Seahawk uniforms or the orange crush, that's an authorized classic uniform. Alternate. So alternate uniforms, as we know, like Washington, the commanders have the black uniform. That's an alt uniform, right? 
the Ravens have a black uniform. That's an alt uniform. It's not it's <clears throat> within the color scheme, but it's a totally different color than the, the purple or the white that we're accustomed to seeing them wear, right? That's the alt uniform. Um, the Broncos, their alt uniform is usually the all orange, right? There's the brown, the white is usually your road unis. The, the blue is usually your home. And then they can wear the, the orange or the blue is usually home. And the orange is your alt uniform, so forth and so forth, right? So, uh, or you could bring back your color rush. I think that's interesting too, because I enjoyed some of the color rush. A lot of the color rush were nasty though, right? Remember the ketchup and mustard game with the Bucks and the Rams? Yeah, that's nasty. We had some really nasty color rush units. Then we had some really dope ones. And some teams have kept them, like the Saints kept their color rush, the all-white uniforms. Uh, they kept those, right? And they still wear them to this day. Some teams have adopted that as an alt uniform. So you can have an alt helmet uh, for that purpose. Like the Saints, for instance, that's a good team to use as an example. They have a black helmet that they wear. When the league allowed them to start wearing um, another helmet, they started wearing a black helmet. They didn't used to be able to do that. Now, when they wear some of these alt uniforms, the black helmet looks a little bit better with it, so they can do that. Uh, if the if the Saints uh, were adopting a a, a, sw a, sl a slight tweak, they could also it, adopt a white helmet if they wanted to. We've seen teams do that over the last couple of years. Cincinnati. Uh, being really the first to really adopt a white helmet and, and kind of change up the look. Uh, I think somebody else had a white helmet last season. I can't remember who, but Cincinnati, they did it the best with their all white uni, uh, unis. And uh, you may see a couple of teams, you know, go to a different look, like an all white helmet, you know, or another color that fits their scheme. Um, and it might look pretty dope, just depending on you know who the team is, what uniform they're going to wear it with. Uh, it's a, it's another con concept, and uh, we'll see how it goes, right? But the NFL relaxing some of its stringent, strict rules on uniforms, combinations, helmets. It's all good for the league. It's all good for the product, if you ask me. But um, we'll see what happens. Anyway, um, I know this. I know the Broncos are a team that when the NFL put this out on social media, they, you know, had the emoji with the, you know, little magnum, uh, the little uh, eye, right? The little glass eye where they're like, hmm, like kind of like saying, ah, interesting. Uh, so I think they're doing some slight tweaks so they may be able to implement another helmet. So, you know, we'll see, you know, what some of these teams decide to do with uh, this information. But, um. Let's get to the comment section. I got a couple more supers before we get out of here. Duncan Wright, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Duncan Wright, thank you for being a member of the MOBB, writes, why are you on this early? <laughs> I, even I don't drink this early. You have a bedtime all of a sudden. Uh, no, this is the podcast. Normally, you're either at work or you're just getting liquored up by now so you're not usually privy to me doing my podcast episodes this early but generally this is the podcast slot uh it's when i have time and um, i am available that i do the podcast late at night but this is the normal usual podcast slot duncan and i am going to be uh, on later on tonight so if you're all liquored up and ready to demean the commanders uh later on tonight I'll be there, 9 o'clock. See you then, all right? Uh, Jordan Jones, thank you for the Super Chat. Greatly appreciate you. My guy Jordan writes, emailed you, Louie. Okay, I will check that out and uh, see what you're talking about. Hopefully, it, it ended up in one of uh, my emails, the right email, and it's not in the spam. But I will look for it. I will look for the email. So. Anyway, um, digress. You guys, have a good one. Take care. If you're a Commanders fan, I look forward to 
um, chopping it up with you guys later. Hopefully you'll be able to join me nine o'clock tonight. We'll have a lot to discuss uh, about the draft as it pertains to the Washington Commanders. We're really going to dive into uh, the official 30 visits. They've added another four names or five names to the list. So uh, we'll talk about that and um, a bunch more. So hopefully um, you guys will join me for that. But until then, you guys have a good one. Take care. See you next time.